Have you ever been faced with situations that look impossible? Ever found yourself at a juncture in your life where your heart begins to fail you and you are almost giving up? And most times giving up seems a better option than going ahead because the problem is so much you cannot think about contending with it. The easier way is to give up. And that has become the reason for the very sharp and significant increase in cases of depression and suicide around the world. People are taking the only other option out, or at least they control the action. But I am here to give you some wonderful news. God has the power to change any situation in your life. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, so that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Listen to me, child of God. You have a portion in a God of all possibilities. So many times we are just at the very door to a breakthrough and we cannot see it. The Bible passage we just read says the hands of God are not too short that he cannot help you, nor are his ears deaf. Hear me, there's a present help that can take care of any situation. We are going to take a journey in this video, and by the end of it you will be able to see that God can change situations. You are not alone. God is with you. The most painful part of our trials and pains is the fact that most of us feel alone, and many times we are. It feels like nobody cares. The world is going on around you like everything is fine, while your own world is in shambles. The loneliness of trials makes us feel like the whole world does not give a hoot if you die or fade away. I remember the story of Job in the Bible, a very wealthy and upright man who God and the devil had a bet on. In 24 hours, this wealthy merchant had lost everything he had. He had lost his daughters, his wealth, his joy, and even his health. His friends and wife gathered around him in this pain and anguish and taunted him to curse God and die because, according to them, death was better than the calamity of life he had become. Job held on to his faith and passed through the worst form of mockery in history, mockery from his friends and family. It looked bleak like Job was going to die in this one. He had sores on his body and had nothing to his name any longer aside from God, but he held on because he knew that he was not alone. In the Bible speaking in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verse 5, God says, No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. You are not alone. There is a God who is aware and who is with you. You are not going through this patch of life alone. Whenever the devil whispers into your heart about how alone you are in your battles, I want you to encourage your heart with this scripture from Joshua. God says he is with you and will not abandon you. Do you remember when you were younger and you used to think every alleyway had a monster waiting for you? The scariest walk of my life was one I had to take through a very dark street in the evenings on my way from the court, dark and scary as anything I remember. But I also remember how bold I would be to enter those alleys when I was with my big brother or sisters. I was not scared of that street whenever I had the compliment of my elder siblings. The same way your confidence is boosted by the knowledge that God is with you, the God of wonders is with you. The one who has the ability to change the situation in your favor is with you, and you have his undying backing. It is not over yet. The worst lie the devil tells believers is to make them believe that they've lost the battle. My pastor preached a message titled, Just a Little While Longer, and it blessed my soul. The word of God in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God was speaking to Jeremiah about a future and a hope. Jeremiah at this point was a product of a slave system in another land, someone who was being held in a strange land out of force. And God came to him to tell him and his people that he had a hope and a future and that he had plans for them. Hey, until the future and hope of God are made manifest in your life and destiny, it is not permitted to be over for you. You belong to a heritage that carries the finisher's touch. God will not abandon you in your trials. In fact, he has a plan that ends perfectly for you, no matter the storm. A person who is in God's future and has hope does not get consumed by trials. God will orchestrate everything to work in your favor. 
Have you actually considered the meaning of the omnipotence of God? I took time out one semester in school to actually sit down and think about the realm of omnipotence, where you have the power to call things that are not as though they were, and you can see their physical manifestation. That is the realm our God exists in, a realm that defies time and happenstance. Listen to me. It does not matter how long the devil and his challenges have been with you. It does not matter how many places you have gone and yet no help has been forthcoming. God possesses the powers of omnipotence, which allow him to reverse, create, and destroy, if necessary, in your favor. Hang in there a little while longer. God doesn't promise us that the world would be without troubles and tribulations. All through the Bible are pointers, warnings, and cautions about tougher and tougher times to come. The Apostle Paul in his teachings taught about how we should prepare ourselves for the evil days. Even Jesus spoke about the dark times that we will experience in our journey to destiny. But the victory belongs to those who do not quit. There's no victor halfway, and there's no crown when the race is abandoned. Challenges will push you to just throw your hands in the air in surrender, and you will be consumed by the problems in your life. But there's a finisher's ability that God energizes you with when you hang on. God's kingdom is ruled by principles and covenants. Even on these principles and covenants comes with its rewards. One of the rewards promised to those who hang in and put in the fight is the crown of glory. The Bible speaks about the crown of glory in James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The crown of glory is for those who fight. Quitters don't get any rewards. When the devil is telling you to quit, it is because he has seen the glory at the end of the travail. Do not quit just yet. Hang in there for a little while longer because God steps into the fight when you realize that by your own strength, you cannot do it. Hang in there and get God involved. Remember the omnipotence of God. Nothing is truly lost or over until God says it is. One of the best things about God is his system of reward. I have seen restoration in my life and in the lives of those around me. If there's anything I believe about God, it's the fact that anything can be fixed and anything can be restored. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was barren and grieved to her core about it. The time came and she went to pray at Shiloh. The story of the birth of the prophet Samuel is recorded in the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. The Bible records how God gave Hannah a son who became a prophet, Samuel the spiritual judge of all of Israel, and an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ, just because his mother didn't accept that she was barren. God is in the business of restoring things and lives. God sent Moses to Egypt to restore his people, the Israelites, from slavery into a land he had planned for them. On the journey out of Egypt, the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he chased the Israelites with his soldiers with the intention of returning them back to his slave camps. Moses led the Israelites to the Red Sea, and it looked like that was the end of the road because in front of them was a sea that nobody could cross. It got worse when they turned around and saw the thousands of Egyptian army soldiers on their horses coming at them. Caught between a charging army and a sea, they went into panic mode and began to express their fears. But the Bible registers an account in the book of Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, that Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The end of the story is well known to us. One of the biggest miracles in history was performed on that day. At that time, the Red Sea parted, and the people walked. Do you think God's not interested in what you're dealing with? Have you concluded that maybe this issue is bigger than God, and you're all on your own, one way or the other? This video is a message from God to you. It may have been long since you last saw God in your life. You may have been crying for a long time. You may be praying, and it just seems like your prayer isn't going beyond your ceiling. Let this message bring you hope, my friend. God is still in control and he hears your cry. There's a song by Hillsong United 
with lyrics that go, I lift my hands to heaven. Here my heart surrendered. I tell my soul again, You are Lord of all. Though the seas are raging, You will speak and tame them. In you I find rest. You are in control. I don't know the seas before you or the chaos going on in your life right now. However, I want to remind you of the God we serve. You see, this is valuable because sometimes we easily forget God because we're so focused on what's before us. We forget the one within us because of the ones around us. It's said that though you have two eyes, you can't look at two things in opposite directions at the same time. One must have your attention than the other. One must pale and focus to the other. When tears seem to have no end, and it becomes hard to believe that God hears anything you say or has a plan to end the crisis in your life, remember this, He is still in control. Let me remind you again. God is sending you this message to remind you that He hears you, and He has a plan to help you. He will come through for you. He is never late. No, never. Let me tell you something about God. He is the God who will do everything possible to rescue His people. Even if He has to pave a way through the sea, He's the one who cares less about death and will resurrect a man who's being buried for four days already. He's the God who can use a small morsel to feed a thousand people with huge leftovers to take home after. He's the God who stands at the beginning and the end at the same time, walking with His people through their situations. He makes all things beautiful in His time, not yours, but His. You have to start from here, my friend. Remember your Father. He is in charge. No one can change that forever. One of the greatest disservices you can do for yourself is putting God on a timer. That's rest. Something like, God, I need this or that in the next 24 hours. This is not faith, my friend. I apologize on behalf of any person who might have taught you that. Faith is not putting God on your terms. Rather, faith is choosing to risk everything to lay claim on what God's given you by His own terms. For you, walking in faith isn't about when, but about fruition. Hebrews 11.1, 1, talking about faith, says, Now faith is confidence in what we hoped for, an assurance about what we do not see. Faith is saying, God, I trust that you love me and want what's best for me. This is what I need in my life right now. I need it here or there. I don't want to focus on the options that are outside of you. From the natural view, it seems absurd to trust an invisible God for such a miracle, but Father, I am choosing to trust you for this. I claim the promise of your word over this area, and I stand upon it, believing that you'll come through for me. Now, Lord, I don't give any room to fear or worry in my life. Instead, I choose to laugh, rejoice, dance, and be thankful. Why? Because I'm convinced that you've got this. Do you notice I said nothing about time? Someone may say, okay, what about emergency situations that are time dependent? What do you do about that? Well, the first thing to consider is this. Does God have eyes to see that you're in an emergency? If your answer is yes, then you just ask for his intervention in the current situation and then trust. The key word here is trust. Trust gives peace and rest. Isn't it amazing how you could be in a difficult situation, pick up your phone, and after calling the emergency service and being assured that there's a unit on its way to help you, you feel more relaxed? Why? Because you believe that they'll come just as the operator told you. We give so much confidence to humans like us, but struggle to have the same when God, our Creator and limitless God is concerned. The devil makes our situation so pressing that trusting God to come through becomes like a risk too hard to take, when in reality it's supposed to be our first response to everything. The Bible says that the righteous person, people who have received the salvation of Christ, will live by faith. In other words, they'll live by their confidence in God and not by confidence in men. Apostle Paul wrote again in 2 Corinthians 5-7, Our life is lived by faith, 
We do not live by what we see in front of us. Dear Saint, what's in front of you right now? The bills, the threat, the annoying boss, repeated struggles with sin, marriage crises, another divorce is on the way, the doctor's report, whatever it is. One of the fastest causes of frustration and depression is worry. Worry about things yet to happen in your life. Worry over an unending crisis. Worry over repeated cycles of abnormalities. One or all of these is a major cause of the tears of every person on earth. In Isaiah's prophecy, he spoke of a time when darkness will cover the earth with thick darkness all over the place. One of the symptoms of darkness is sorrow. Depression is a product of sorrow. And the thing is, we live in a day and age where someone can be at the final stages of depression and no one would know. He or she could stand in front of the camera every day for the whole world to see. I could stand in front of the pulpit and declare the message of hope. But when no one's looking, tears and sighs are my companion. David wrote about such times in his life as well. Think about the things this man, after God's heart, struggled with. He'd experienced the grief of losing his best friend Jonathan, his baby with Bathsheba. His older son Amnon raped his half-sister Tamar and was murdered by her brother, his own half-brother, Absalom, the same Absalom who would later turn on his father David, start a coup, and seek to take his father's life. Psalm 69, 1-12 outlines one of his down moments in these few words. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Think about this for a moment. Did the man after God's own heart also struggle with depression. You see, most times when we look at the Bible, we think most of the people there were immune to the things you struggle with in your daily lives. But that's not true. These people also suffered evacuation crises, court orders and property injustices, infidelity and marriage. Knowing God called you and still failing at the thing you were so convinced about, and lots more. In fact, the Bible refers to these ones as people who, out of weaknesses, were made strong. Each Bible character who became a testimony is set apart because they chose to believe something we don't want to hear in the face of our own struggles. And that is, God is in control. After all his cries, see what David ended his prayers with in the same Psalms 69, 29-36. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, May your salvation, God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify Him in thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with its horns and hooves. The people will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise His captive people. Let heaven and earth praise Him the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. Then people will settle there and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it. And those who love his name will dwell there. 
These, my friend, are the words of one who has chosen to take the risk of committing his situation to God and resting, knowing that God has heard him and will bring him safely through his challenge. It doesn't matter how tough the situation may be right now. It doesn't matter what you seem to be losing right now. It does not matter what you're being threatened with. Listen, have you talked to God about it yet? If you have, then leave it to Him to take care of it. He knows more than you do. He knows what's best. Let Him in by praying and standing on His promise. Then let Him know, like David, that He is your only chance, that you're willing to bet your everything on Him. Then see God in action. Have you been believing for something at the right time? God will make everything right. He will perfect all needed to bring beauty into your life. All He wants is your confidence in His ability. Hold on, friend. Your tears are not wasted. Your prayers are not lost. God hears them, and He will come through for you. Just a little while longer. If you can hold on long enough, you'll see Him come through for you. Don't give up. Do you feel God is trying to grab your attention, but you seem to be ignoring Him? What could be the clear signs that God's telling you something and you're ignoring Him? Just about anywhere you go, you'll come across some sort of warning, whether in the form of symbols, lights, barriers, or announcements. It seems we're governed by warnings from parents, police, governments, doctors, employers, and so on. You would think that all these warnings would have made our world a better and safer place to live. On the contrary, the world we live in is sinking deeper and deeper into lawlessness and despair. Laws are disobeyed or ignored daily. And each time we ignore a warning, there's a risk of paying a price. Be reminded that even as there are warnings on the road, God paints similar warning signs for us as we journey through our Christian race. It says in Proverbs 1, 20 to 21, Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. She calls out to the crowds along the main street and those in front of City Hall. The most ignored warnings are those from God. The first warning man ignored was given by God at creation, and every subsequent law and warning given by God has been disobeyed. Warnings can be annoying, but we all know that they will save our lives. God's warnings and laws are for your good and benefit. They're not just there to deprive you of the good things in life, rather to help you in your Christian and daily life. God says He has plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope in a future. So are God's warnings, too. They're there for your good, not to harm you. They are to direct you into a better future. Warnings are a gift from God. They're like a compass in the hands of a traveler. Sometimes God will warn you through other people. Sometimes He warns you through His Word. Sometimes through dreams. And sometimes, He warns you through a Bible sermon. Many times when God's dealing with you about a certain thing, He'll deliver multiple messages from different sources to get your attention. You may hear the pastor preach a message, then read a devotion the next day, then hear a song on the radio, and they all deal with the same subject. When you attack the messenger because you don't like the message, you're ignoring God's warnings. You give more value to the way you think, more than you give to God's Word and His warnings. How wrong we are when we think our thoughts are more valuable than God's. And to beat it all, the only time we agree with God is when it falls right in line with what we think. When God warns us of a hazard, it's wise to trust Him, even when we can't see the danger for ourselves. Turn around, don't drown, isn't just a cute slogan. It's sage advice that could save your life during a flood. You don't ignore posted warning signs or drive past barriers at low water crossings, even if there is no visible water in the immediate area. A blind man who doesn't follow the lead of his guide will eventually fall into a ditch. As a human, you are myopic. 
limited and short-sighted. You need the guidance of God Almighty who sees the end from the beginning. God is an all-seeing and all-knowing God. God is perfect and without mistakes. Mobile phone companies design mobile phones to display a warning notification when the battery is below a certain level. And what happens when you ignore that warning and don't plug your phone in? Yeah, your phone dies. The same thing happens when you ignore the warning sound of the smoke detector. The same thing happens when you ignore God's warnings. King Manasseh of Judah stands as an example of what can happen when someone ignores God. Despite the example of his godly father Hezekiah, Manasseh abandoned the Lord and led his people into idolatry. He was deaf to God's recurrent warnings and carried on with his evil for quite a while. But in time, God finally got his attention through a painful situation involving the Assyrian military. Humbled, Manasseh repented and began obeying the Lord instead of ignoring him. Even more important than ignoring the semaphore of a smoke detector, ignoring God's warning in His Word and completely tuning them out for any reason is a dangerous road to tread on. Therefore, if God has dropped a warning about a particular thing and you haven't obeyed or listened to the warnings, you should watch for these signs. 1. You become spiritually exposed you won't have God's protection and God's backing in your life because you choose to ignore God's warning on that particular matter and choose to do it with your human knowledge. The devil knows when we don't have protection. When you ignore God's warning and disobey God, you make mistakes and fall into sin. The devil becomes aware of this, making you an easy target for his attacks. God's warning on pornography is a good example. Many describe it as a victimless pleasure. But Jesus pointed out, Everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. A heart that's full of sinful lust not only warps the mind, but will also eventually affect a person's actions. When you go ahead and ignore God's warning about pornography, your mind gets corrupted and it builds up into your action, making you easily fall into the sin of immorality. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way that seems right to a man. This speaks of the path of life a man or a woman walks upon. His path in life seems fine to him, and he wonders why God or anyone else would have a different opinion. The issue is how deceptive evil is. It might promise to deliver happiness, power in a good life, but it can't sustain what it gives. This makes plain our need to rely completely on God's guidance, completely rely on God's warnings. We can't entirely trust our examination and judgment. To know you're on the path of life instead of the way of death, you need to fear the Lord and begin to hear His warnings. You become merely religious when you ignore God's warnings. You'll notice how you'll begin to do things mechanically rather than spiritually. Everything in your life will stay the same and feel ordinary as though something is missing. You'll sing the same songs. You'll say the same prayers. They may have nice words, but you'll feel something's out of place. You'll feel there's still something you haven't done. As a result, you become spiritually dry. Have you ever ignored one of God's warnings concerning you, and then when it's prayer hour, you feel as though you're alone and as if God isn't there with you? Everything becomes difficult when you see yourself making bad decisions over and over. This might be the case. Here's one thing we can count on. Ignoring God's warnings always breeds tragedy. That makes sense, because the one who made us knows far better than anyone else what's best for us. 2. Guilt, fear, and a crushed spirit This is what happens when you ignore God. When you're living in a way your Father in Heaven doesn't approve, He tries to correct you, but you ignore His warnings. Something happens inside you. Something happens in your spirit. And your spirit can be crushed by guilt, and you'll lose confidence. 
Like Shakespeare's Macbeth, the knowledge of our sin can produce ghosts or shadows that haunt us. And we flee, even when no one's pursuing. When you seek God's counsel in His Word, in His house, and in prayer, then do what He says to do. You live life with enthusiasm and exuberance. You can live life as bold as a lion, but when you don't seek His counsel, when you ignore Him and plot your own path, your spirit isn't right. You're suddenly influenced by guilt and fear, even if you don't express it on the surface, even if it's at the unconscious level. Deep in your heart, you're not whole. You're not right in your spirit. So read the scriptures and bring your problems to Him in prayer. Then do what He says, so you can live life as bold as a lion. Spiritually, you die when you ignore God's warning about a particular matter. Whether it's for you to let go of a former lifestyle or maybe let go of someone who isn't helping you grow. God has seen the end of the situation and He's warning you to stop it. If you ignore these warnings and continue in sin, you're punished by death. Not necessarily physical death, but separation from God and loss of spiritual sensitivity is a form of death too. Physically, mentally, and spiritually sinning will cause you to move away from the source of life, which is Jesus. Scripture says in Proverbs 10, 17, He who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. Nothing good comes from ignoring God's warning. You need God's perfect guidance in all areas of life, such as marriage, business, choice of profession, or where to settle. If you want success, protection, and to be in the place you were called to be, you must seek God's face and promptly give ear to His warnings. Did you ever give good advice to someone who ignored it and made a disastrous choice? It can leave you wondering why they even bothered to ask you for advice in the first place. It's ridiculous. Imagine if you've lived in a particular neighborhood for years and a new neighbor moves in, and then they ask you where the nearest grocery store is, and you show them. You even go on to name the landmarks on the way to the grocery store. You feel happy inside to help a new neighbor, but just as you finish, they go on their own way, and it's different from the directions you gave. We get frustrated when others ignore our wisdom, but have you ever thought about how often we do that to God? No one gives better guidance than God. And yet we all, at times, ignore what He says. We ignore God's warning. Isn't that more ridiculous? God created you and has ordained a destiny and a path for your entire life, and yet you ignore His warnings. You ignore God's direction. The principle of obeying and following God's path is so important that God repeated it in Proverbs 16.25, which says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. In the Old Testament of the Bible, King Ahab of Israel habitually ignores God's advice. Ahab decides he wants to go to war against Ramoth Gilead. In Ahab's opinion, victory is certain if King Jehoshaphat joins him. Jehoshaphat is willing to help, but not before getting God's opinion. Ahab produced 400 so-called prophets who predicted victory. But only one prophet truly speaks for God, however, and he warns them that Ahab will die if they go to war. The king ignored God's warning and died on the first day of battle. Like Ahab, when you ignore God's warnings, it always leads to destruction. Ignoring God's warning and giving full vent to your anger can destroy relationships. Ignoring God's warning about managing money responsibly can destroy your finances. And ignoring God's warnings concerning your lifestyle and continuing to live without integrity can destroy your career. How are you choosing to live? Do you pay attention to God's warnings? Or are you living with your own set of standards? Your conscious choices affect your walk with Jesus. If you tune your spirit to listen and discipline yourself to obey, you'll enjoy great success in intimacy with the Lord. What troubles your heart today? God is sending you this message to comfort and bring hope to your heart. Do not let your heart be troubled. 
Trust God with the cares of tomorrow. Everything is going to be fine for those who put their trust in Him. One of my favorite quotes says, Faith is not knowing what the future holds, but who holds the future. One of the greatest burdens of life is the worry of how our future will turn out. Almost everyone, if not truly everyone, carries about the deep desire to escape whatever unfavorable or unfortunate event may happen. Sometimes we are so engrossed in this pursuit that we miss what it truly means to live in the present. Let me ask you a question. I know we do not have the ability to travel in time, but if you did, would you travel back in time or forward in time? What difference would you try to make if you did? I guess when you think about it, you can realize that these two things are impossible to do, humanly speaking. However, there is one called the Ancient of Days, the first and last, beginning and end. He is God. He is the only one who can fix your past, your present, and your future. You see, when you look at it from a human standpoint, you can see that it is the days, nights, weeks, months, and years that make time. And time is the wall between you, your past, and your future. No one has control of time except God, because it is His creation. You can use time wisely or wastefully, but you cannot hasten or stop it. Only God can because it is his creation. Hence, when David calls him an ever-present help in trouble, he wasn't just referring to the fact that God is always there when we call him, but he is an ever-present being. Past, present, and future are all present before him. Why? Because there is neither day nor night with God. The Bible confirms this about the city of God in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. We also know that the sun and moon which define the day and night for us are just elements of our solar system. There are greater lights in our galaxy, the stars out in space. David would also shed light on the present nature of God in Psalms 121 verses three through four. He will not let your foot slip. He who catches over you will not slumber indeed. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And in verse eight, he concludes, the Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. What parent or guard has the ability to watch over anyone for a lifetime? What person can actively watch over another forever without falling asleep? absolutely nobody. But the Bible says the Lord watches over his people. He neither gets tired nor needs to sleep. He does not retire. He is always watching over his own. How much do you think it would make God's heart grieve to watch you live like he doesn't exist or can't do anything about your life? Don't you know that the reason God made man limited in many ways is for us to depend on him? Do you know that the reason you cannot see or go into the future except in time is so that you can trust him with the unknown? Humanity was not created to be independent from God, but to depend on him. God is meant to be your source, your hope, and your life. Apart from God, we have no essence. He is your essence. He is aware you have needs. He is aware of your unfulfilled dreams. He is aware of the plans and expectations in your heart, and he has promised to perfect things that concern you if you can trust him with each one. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Some other translations call it all your cares. God wants you to cast those cares in your heart, the deadlines, the expectations, and the anxieties over your tomorrow into his hands. Don't take them on by yourself. You will wear yourself out. When you try to fix your tomorrow without God's help, you will lose every present opportunity he places around you today. Jesus told us in Matthew 6 that God is very much aware of the needs in your life and that your fears, worries, or anxieties cannot make any difference. You don't get better by worrying. 
Your anxiety only affects you and not your situation or the object making you anxious. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. No one has ever paid off debts, cleared deadlines, escaped being kicked out of their home or any other unfavorable circumstances by worrying or being anxious. I have yet to meet that one person who worried so much over their troubles that the worries just disappeared. However, I have seen people change the trajectory of their lives by introducing God into the scene through faith. I have seen people turn situations in their lives around by letting God take the wheel. This is the believer's greatest testimony. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Psalms 115 verse one. It is not that they were smart enough, strong enough or rich enough, but that God came through for you. And he always does. Today, God is saying, trust me with the cares of your tomorrow. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't fret about what the future holds. Don't forget that God will never let you fear for a future you entrust into his hands. Oh, I love how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Can you see that? may appear like you don't know what you are talking about. It may look like you are confused or lost. It may even appear like you have subjected yourself to a life of suffering. However, when you trust God with your tomorrow, he is able to guard it until the right time. The future that is guaranteed is the one entrusted to God. Listen, what makes you a Christian is that you believe and trust the mystery of God's integrity. This means that you are among those who have chosen to walk by thus says the Lord rather than by how you feel or by the things happening around you. The great Smith Wigglesworth wrote, I am not moved by what I see, how I feel, or by what the world says. I am moved only by what I believe, and I believe God's word. That, my friend, is the summary of the faithful life to which you and I have been called. But you may be asking, How do I do it? How do I trust God with the cares of my tomorrow? It is simple. Here are four things to do concerning the worries or cares for your tomorrow. Number one, pray about the issues of your anxiety for tomorrow. The Bible tells us that rather than worrying or being anxious over the future you cannot change or do anything about, pray and commit it to God. Philippians chapter four, verse six says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Make a list if you can, and make sure you tell God about each of them and how they affect you. He is aware, but still he wants you to talk to him about it. You are building a relationship with him through the time you spend in prayer. Number two, 
Find God's promise connected to the issue in mind and stand on it. Each time you stand on God's word, you stand on his integrity. God's word never fails anyone who stands on it without wavering. Remember that Peter walked on the water, not only because Jesus was there, but because he was standing on Jesus' word, come. This word kept him above the sea and its waves. Develop the habit of searching through God's word. There is a word for every situation in your life. It may not be explicitly mentioned, but it can be relative and connected to you. You can stand on it and trust God to honor it in your life. Number three, make sure that your confessions align with what you believe God says about your tomorrow. One of the reasons Zechariah, the father of John, was muted until the naming ceremony of his son was because he would probably have used his mouth to confess doubt and thereby nullify the miracle of John's birth. Your words are powerful. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Hence, you will always have what you say. If you keep talking about how your tomorrow is going to be, a bad day and nothing good is in your future, that is what you will have. However, when you say great things and claim the promises of God for your future, you will enter it one day. Number four, keep your heart open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit by avoiding distractions or anything that will weaken your faith. Having a heart open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit will help you know when God is moving and help you to be ready to move too. Don't let distractions, mockery, or pressures from anyone or anything make you take your eyes away from the Lord. Stay focused and expectant. He will come through for you. What happens when you make the decision to trust God with the cares of tomorrow? One of the many things that God does for those who trust him with the cares of tomorrow is that he fills their hearts with peace. Isaiah chapter 26, verse three says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. This peace is a gift from God. It comes from a place of confident trust in who God is and what he has said. Among other things, Nothing adds more meaning to the present like peace. You can never truly live if you lose your peace, but when there is peace, even with little or with suffering, you are whole. It is time to embrace the peace only God can give by exchanging your fears and anxieties for the confidence of his unfailing mercy and grace. Trust God, he never fails. Worrying is one of the biggest deceptions in this life. It is a burden we willingly take upon ourselves as a result of disturbing thoughts over issues that sometimes have nothing to do with us, or issues we honestly have no power to do anything about. Worry often works hand in hand with fear and anxiety. We worry about almost everything, bills, finances, the economy, government policies, politics, family members, relationships, school exams, or jobs. We even worry about the past and the future. Jesus took time in Matthew 6 and began to teach his followers, including people like you and me, who will put our faith in him years later. You see, God is aware of the issues that can trigger worry in your heart. He does not want you ignoring them acting in denial or being irresponsible about anything. In fact, the Bible does encourage us to be responsible at our duties and provide solutions. However, worry and planning to produce solutions are two different things. One gives you something to focus on, a dream to pursue, and a goal to reach. The other robs you of peace and then causes you to be afraid and panic without really coming up with any helpful solution. This instead leads to more frustration and depression. For example, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were listed among the counselors and advisors who King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to execute at one point in time. This was not because they did anything wrong, but because after inquiring from the other advisors and magicians, none could tell him his dream nor its interpretation. 
When Daniel learned about the king's decree to execute them all along with the other advisors, he asked the king for a little more time. When I was studying this, I realized two things. One, Daniel had a choice to either panic about their current predicament, how their lives were about to be ended, or to seek a solution. Of course, he chose the latter. Secondly, people who know God and are intimate with him don't panic over issues, no matter how serious they appear to be. David exemplified this at the battlefield when others were too afraid to confront Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32 says, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Daniel and his friends, rather than go inside and think of a way to run for dear life or wail over the king's decree, shut themselves indoors and sought God for the solution to the current problem. And guess what? God answered. Daniel chapter 2 verses 17 through 19 says, And Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and Daniel praised the God of heaven. They were a source of inspiration to one another. Let us seek the Lord over this matter. By ourselves, we can't do anything about some issues, but we should turn to the only one who can. They did, and the rest was history. For their sakes, the rest of the advisors were spared from the king's blade. Do you know that worry has killed more people than the issues they panicked about? Remember that I told you that worry and fear go hand in hand. Also, worry is not from God, and if it is not from above, then it definitely comes from the devil. If it doesn't come from above, then it is a problem. Why? Because the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father. Hence, if it doesn't come from the Father, it is not good or perfect. I know that you are dealing with an issue in your life right now. As I prepare this message, even I have my own issues before me. However, one thing I do and I encourage you to do as you listen to this message is to honestly tell yourself the truth about your worrying, that it does not solve your problem. It only robs you of your peace, your joy, and even your reason to live. An individual can get drawn to alcoholism because of worry. A mother can get very sick with high blood pressure over a wayward child. As painful as all of these things can be, it is sad that in admitting concern for a problem, you successfully add to it. Now, the mother does not only have the wayward child to deal with anymore, her health has also been compromised. So instead of one battle, she has succeeded in giving the enemy another opportunity to fight her. Beloved, do not give the enemy room in your life by entertaining his suggestions to walk in worry. Don't let your heart fail you. God cares about your today and your tomorrow. And if you trust him with it, he will cover it for you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus covered everything on worry in this passage. So, whether you are worrying about your rent being due, your school fees or children's school fees being overdue, your fridge being empty of groceries, your irresponsible or unfaithful spouse, naughty or wayward kids, and so on. God admits that these are troubles of this life, but that you should not allow worrying about them to become a characteristic of who you are. There isn't anyone who will be awarded the most worried person. You know why? Even though the world may tell you that it is okay to worry, they also know that worry is not a value, but a burden. Imagine worrying that the sun rose a little later than usual today. Imagine worrying over how the clouds moved. The truth is, whether you worry or not, you do not have the power to do anything about any of these things, but you have power over yourself and what you choose to ponder. Your worries won't pay the bills, but God's provision can. Your worry may not be able to heal sickness and disease, but God's power called upon in prayer can even raise the dead. Your worry can go into the future and correct things on your behalf, but the Spirit of the Lord can. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 2, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. Have you seen how security details guard their employer? They are already out of the car before he or she steps down. They are already inside and surveying a building before their employer gets there. They have already met with and searched any stranger before he gets to him or her. Why? Because their employer is their job. As long as he or she is alive, they get to have their jobs another day. It is their duty to keep him or her alive, and they take it seriously, both for their wallets and for their credibility as capable protectors. These guys may not truly care, but they take their jobs seriously. Although they know they can also get caught in the line of an attack, they move anyway. How much more does God Say that to yourself again. How much more does my God? He loves and cares about you so much that he promises to go ahead into the future for your sake and make the way straight for your feet. If God has gone ahead of you, what does worrying about what is ahead tell him? It means you don't trust that he has dealt with what's ahead. Worry is a property of doubt. You cannot claim to have faith and be worried at the same time. You have to make a choice. Do I choose to keep worrying or do I choose to take God at his word? What happens to those who take God at his word and take steps of faith into their future? They return with testimonies. When God tells you to go and he will take care of things, stop worrying about it because it's already done. Remember that past and present are always before him. The future is not hidden from his gaze. Yes, he has his timing, but he is never late because before you get there, he is already there waiting for you. It is time for you to make the decision to replace your worry with faith. It is time to say, instead of panicking, I am going to praise God and remind myself of his faithfulness. Your heavenly Father cares deeply about you and what your tomorrow holds. He wants you to cast those cares on Him because of His care for you. Whatever you entrust to Him, like Daniel and his friends, He takes care of it and gives you the solution you need to break forth into testimonies. What will you do today, dear believer? Will you continue to wallow in self-pity, worry, fear, and restlessness? Or will you rise up and say, I can't be worrying alongside God. Let him take care of my issues. Like David, I trust him to perfect what concerns me. I choose his peace and rest in his love now and forever. Are you wondering if you're walking on the right path in life? Sometimes life can be confusing. We wonder, how do I know what my purpose in life is and how do I achieve it? 
There are so many different paths we can follow. We have ideas and goals that we want to accomplish, but we're not sure if our plan is God's plan. How do I know that I'm on the right path that God has created for me? Is this a path to my destiny? How do I know for sure? Amid your questions, you might think God has been silent, but if you look intently, you'll discover He's been sending you confirmation that you're walking in the right direction. God always wants His children to walk on the right path. He says in Jeremiah 6.16, This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find the rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. This passage clearly expresses His desire to see His children walk the right path even though we're usually choosing to walk in the opposite direction. Here are some signs that you're on the right path. The world rejects or dislikes you because of the truth you stand for. If you or your views are being rejected and criticized by the world, it's a confirmation that you're on the right path. Jesus told his disciples this while he was on the earth. If the world hates us, we must remember that they hated him too. In other words, if you're walking on the path Jesus walked, the godless world will hate you. And if the world doesn't hate you and your ideals, then you might have to check your path because you're probably not like Jesus. You have two choices. You either please God or you please the world, but you can't please both because they're opposites. You can either offend God or offend the world. If you agree with the general trend of the world, it means you're not on the right path. Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 to 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The narrow gate is a right path leading to heaven, and only a few people find it. It's narrow because the world's excesses can't go there. Only those willing to let go of them are able to travel this path. On the other hand, the broad path is the worldly path, and it's crowded because it permits everything. Should such a world heading towards destruction have power over your thoughts and actions? Instead, we need to have our thoughts and actions brought into submission to God's word. A holy person is not worldly. A holy person is someone who's living solely to do God's will. You can't be holy and ungodly at the same time. You'll know you're on the right path with God when your path diverges from the world and converges with God's other true saints. Secondly, you constantly see God working on your behalf and walking beside you. Another sign that you're on the right path is that during the trials and temptations of life, you see God's presence with you and His hand in your situation. God's way is the best way, but it isn't always the easiest the Christian journey will have obstacles. God will not necessarily remove these obstacles and challenges from your way. However, He will be with you as you face them, which is the best solution. Your flesh will fight you. The world will fight you, and the devil will fight you. But God will be with you, and He will use this all for your good when you follow Him in faith. Please understand that God never causes temptations in our lives. However, He does allow some. God uses tests and trials to help us grow into faithful believers. Unfortunately, people tend to believe that because they're facing some adversity, that means they're on the wrong path. And the devil goes about speaking to believers in their trials, saying, God's against you. God's angry at you. He's the enemy and he doesn't love you. But Psalm 23 shows you that even with God on your side, you can go through the valley of death or very difficult situations. The testimony, however, is that even in the darkest of night, you are never alone. So don't think the valley is an automatic sign that you're on the wrong path, for David knew God was leading him on the right path. Even though he was going through the darkest valley, God was doing this for his glory and was with David through it all. As James 1.12 also states, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life 
that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. God is involved in the lives of His people and their situations. Victories over obstacles in life are sure proof that you're walking in accordance with God's path for your life. An example is Job, who although he was on the right path and was even described as a perfect and upright man, found himself in a very grievous situation. Job lost everything he had except his life and his wife who would later ask him to curse God and die. But God was still with him. In the end, he gave Job double all of what he lost. The truth is, there are some things about God that you can only learn during the season of trials and temptations. Nevertheless, always remember that as long as you're with the Lord and are assured of His presence, you are on track. You have an internal peace. Every waking moment could be filled with constant struggle. You may be juggling multiple jobs just to make ends meet. You may feel like nothing is working out, no matter how hard you try. You might see yourself as a failure, remembering every wrong decision you've made in your life down to this very moment. However, amidst all these concerns you encounter, if you still feel peace and serenity deep inside you, it's a sign from God you're walking on the right path. Do you remember Jesus sleeping on a boat in the middle of a storm? You'll experience the same when you're on the right path. Regardless of how terrible the storm is, you can sleep and be assured that God is leading you to a safe place. You see, peace is not the absence of the storm, but a steady advancement in the midst of the chaos with confidence in the help of God. You'll have great confidence and absolute peace when God is leading you. When you're not following God's will, the Holy Spirit who lives in all Christians will bring a loving conviction to your heart. You'll feel a lack of peace in your inner being. You will feel a godly guilt that makes you restless until you retrace your steps. If you have absolute peace in your mind, your life may still be hard and confusing at times. But deep down, you will know that you're doing the right thing and are truly following God's will for your life. You find help and support from people around you. God has wired humans to need and help each other. He's made us interdependent upon one another so that we can be a source of blessings to each other. Therefore, if you start noticing miraculous help and support when you need it to do what God's asking you to do, it's a sign. He's saying you're right where He wants you to be. You need like-minded people that God can use to encourage you, pray for you, and empower you. Does the enemy also favor and bless people with success? Yes but never towards pleasing God or fulfilling God's purpose. This is how you recognize those God sends to help you. Their help and support contributes in moving you towards God's purpose in obedience to the Word of God. You are growing in your alignment with the Word and your relationship with Jesus Christ. The last thing I want to share is this. You know you're walking on the right path when your decisions agree with God's Word and you feel in your heart that you're experiencing Jesus at a deeper level of intimacy than before. As your relationship with Jesus grows, you will gain a greater and greater understanding of who He is. In knowing Jesus personally, you'll see that He never changes and never fails to show His love towards you. Jesus gives you hope and a purpose when life gets difficult. Knowing that the only way to overcome these difficulties is by depending on His strength and love, you can bravely walk through anything life throws at you. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. The Apostle Paul's singular ambition in life was to know Jesus Christ experientially on a deeper level. Paul wanted something much deeper than mere superficial knowledge of Jesus. Paul wanted to connect with Jesus at the closest possible level. If you're in that season of life where you want to spend time getting to know Jesus more, it's one of the most evident signs that the right path is in front of you. Don't worry too much if you're not in that stage yet. If you're not there yet, you can ask God to give you that desire to get to know Him more. As he said in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, 
Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So, are you walking on the right path? Look for these signs in your life. Let them be the confirmations you need. The advantage of walking on the right path is that it will save you from destruction and regret. There are losses you will escape when you walk the right path. However, if you're currently on a different path, you can call on the Lord today and ask Him to help you retrace your steps. He loves you and wants to guide you on your journey in life. Remember, you're a work in progress and God's not done with you yet. Let Him lead you down the right path today. Let God fight your battles because He always wins. There is no better champion to represent you than the one who has never lost a contest. Listen, your struggles and your battles are valid. They are real. And God knows that they are too much for you. Many times we feel God is not aware of our struggles or wants to have nothing to do with us. The truth is that He does, but we do not always give Him the chance to take over those battles. If you are listening to my voice right now, I encourage you to hand over that struggle in your life to the Lord. Let Him fight your battles for you, and you will find rest in His work. You can't win that struggle by yourself. You need God's help. Otherwise, you'll end up losing the battle again and again. Here is a story of a man named Lawrence Mendoza and how God fought his battle at a challenging season in his life. Because of the power of fervent prayer, he was able to escape a life sentence at a maximum security prison. This happened when he allowed God to take charge of his life after so many years of resisting his will. Lawrence Mendoza was born in the Bronx section of New York City, raised in a single parent home, and was the younger of two brothers. He became well acquainted with emotional pain at the age of five when his father died in a car accident, and he had to live in fear of losing his mother too. Lawrence and his brother were sent to a Catholic school for the majority of their elementary years. Their mother took them to church every Sunday, and Lawrence eventually joined the church and became an altar boy for several years. He would feel peace whenever he was serving as an altar boy in the church. This was always an escape from all the chaos around him. As Lawrence grew through life, he came face to face with various sweet and sour experiences. His life seemed to go well for a while, but then began to spiral down into worse and worse situations. After experiencing a series of bad relationships and dropping out of college, he started dealing with depression. He soon lost his purpose in life. All his self-esteem was lost. He considered himself a nobody and a failure headed for a crossroad, not knowing which direction to choose. At age 24, Lawrence began to smoke marijuana. Within a few days, he had gone deeper, doing harder drugs, specifically cocaine, heroin, dust, PCP, pills and liquor. He did not like the life that he was leading. He also felt like the world had broken its promise to him to love him. You see, he had grown up with the idea that the world loved him and that he would succeed on the strength of that love. He was struggling to find peace because he started seeking his love where there was none to find. Only God can give you unconditional love and peace, child of God. No one else can. One day, Lawrence decided to end his life because he felt miserable. He was stuck in a drug haze when he came to the Spiten Dival Bridge, which connects the Bronx and Manhattan. He climbed to the top. As he straddled the beams, which was about 300 feet above the train tracks in the Hudson River below, he told God that he was tired and was ready to come home. Within minutes, he was surrounded by helicopters, firemen, police, and a camera crew. As he was about to jump, a rescue crew member said, Hey, God loves you, quoted the 23rd Psalm. Shortly after that, Lawrence heard his mother screaming up at him, I love you, son. Please don't jump. That stopped him, and he got down. Lawrence was taken to the psychiatric hospital for a checkup, but he was able to talk his way out of being detained there. 
Although he was rescued that first time, his drug use and suicidal behavior continued for a few more weeks. Depression, mental and emotional torment, and his self-destructive rebellious ways were taking him on a one-way, no-return ticket to hell. One day, he overdosed on drugs purposely to end his life, only to be revived through using a respirator and having his stomach pumped. That same year, he jumped off a seventh-story building while on a drug binge, only to have his belt buckle catch on part of a fire escape, preventing his death and allowing him to be pulled to safety. This episode took him back for another trip to the hospital, and he was treated with electric shock and medicine. It almost seemed like God was standing in his way each time, rescuing him from himself. But he just couldn't break free, nor did he know how to let God in. Even after experiencing God's saving power in which he turned from his sins and accepted Christ, he only managed to stay clean for six months. He didn't utilize the proper weapons to fight against the enemy's devices. He refused to use God's weapons to fight his spiritual battles and he became entangled again. Without a prayer life, Christian fellowship with the Word of God as crucial parts of his life, his struggles continued as if they never left. Remember that the Bible already told us that we are at war in this world and our victory lies in the effective use of the weapons that God has given us as long as we are on the earth. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In his struggle with these things, Lawrence entered three consecutive prison terms. At first, he was sent to minimum security prisons, where he violated his parole conditions each time and was sent back to finish his sentence. He would later be convicted for vehicle theft and seven other felonies, and as a persistent offender, he was facing a minimum 15 years to life in prison. When he tried to escape from the maximum security prison, an additional seven years was added to his sentence. Finally, in a cell for high-profile cases, Lawrence knelt and cried out to the Lord in prayer. He prayed like he never prayed before and asked Jesus Christ to take control of his life once again. He asked the Lord to take control of his present situation. He was committing his battles and struggles into God's hands, and he prayed for strength to go on despite the life sentence he was facing. He asked God to forgive him for all his sins and for trying to live life on his own. About 10 months after that moment, Lawrence experienced God's intervention. He was delivered by God from a life sentence and released. He began regularly attending a Bible study with other believers at church, studying God's Word daily for hours, and growing stronger in a spiritual relationship with the Lord through prayer. He went on to complete his Associate of Religious Education degree, which God used to manifest His Word in his life. At the time of sharing his testimony, Lawrence could boldly say these words, now that I strive daily to allow Jesus Christ full control of my life, I just rest in His peace. I have the Holy Spirit's power now, and I don't lean on my own. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have stepped over the obstacle of fear, of doubt, and of low self-esteem. I know that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, 
Yet not I, but Christ in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I know now through God's word that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I now strive to live by faith in God's word, uplifted by prayer, seek to labor with Holy Spirit power and direction. My heart's desire is to constantly be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and not my own. The state issued me my temporary green clothing with the number 99A-4250 written on them. Today I walk with the new clothes of Christ, which are eternal clothes to fight the spiritual battle. By faith, I wear the holy robes of righteousness given to me when I turned all my life over to Jesus Christ. What an amazing testimony. Doesn't this show you that no matter how far you have gone, God can save you if you let him take over the fight. Anyone genuine will tell you that they understand the testimony of this dear brother because we are all products of God's deliverance. At one point in our lives, we also faced our own struggles. But when we handed over the reins to Christ, we found rest. The secret is this. Things may not change overnight, but that is not the main issue here. It is no longer your fight, no longer your business or worry. Now you rest in his peace with faith that your past is gone and you have a new and better life in Christ. As long as you couldn't find rest from struggling, you were kept a slave. But the moment Christ takes over, you rest in his rest, trusting in his strength. Let the story of Lawrence inspire you to commit yourself to building your spiritual armory with God's weapons, prayer, studying the word, fellowshipping with other saints, and learning to walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's time for you to walk free, not tomorrow. Do it now. Call on the Lord today and ask him to come take control of your battle. He never loses you will experience some of life's greatest victories once you overcome the enemy called fear. And if you are struggling with any kind of fear in your life today, God is speaking these words to you. Fear no more. I am bigger than your problems. What makes the child of God so powerful? Is it because you are strong in yourself? Is it because you are perfect in your own goodness? Are you so good to everyone and at everything that no one would want to come against you? No. The answer is that none of these things are enough to keep fearful situations from coming your way, whether you are a Christian or not. So, what is the Christian secret? Before I tell you, let me say it again. Whatever fearful situation is before you today, whether it is a fear for the future or an unprecedented and impossible situation, you have no reason to live in fear of it. God, your heavenly Father, is bigger and greater than the situation. You have the advantage, dear child of God. Let me encourage you with this story, and in so doing, tell you the Christian secret to a courageous and victorious life without fear. You may have heard the story of David and Goliath from the Bible. It is one of the most popular stories in Scripture. Even contemporary media has adapted the story into a different format. It is the typical example of how the underdog can win a contest despite having all odds stacked against him. However, the story of David and Goliath is more than a top dog underdog story. It is a story of victory over fear with the weapon of faith. Beyond sheer determination, personal intention, or self-glorification, this is the story of how faith will always win the fight over fear, no matter the odds. Jesus told his disciples one day in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. David was a young individual, probably younger than you, at the time he took down the giant Goliath. His father had sent him to the Israelite camp on the battlefield where they had gathered for war against the Philistines. The Bible tells us that his brothers were in the Israelite army 
and their father wanted to know how they were faring. So, David set out with food and their father's warm regards. However, once there, he saw how the entire camp was demotivated and how everyone was scampering here and there in terror. He was surprised to see his nation's warriors this way. He must have wondered why they were like this, seeing that they weren't even in combat at the time. He couldn't help but ask what was going on and why there was chaos. Then the enemy showed up, just one man, a giant called Goliath. Please note that it didn't take the entire army of the Philistines to bring the whole Israelite army to their knees. All it took was for them to shift their focus off the army and onto their champion, Goliath. They kept at this for 40 days straight without fail. It was as if they were administering a drug dose, both morning and evening, and it was effective. If only we could know how the enemy uses the power of consistent focus to weaken our defenses and hold us hostage in many areas today. Satan has always maintained the same old tricks, dear saint. Don't be taken unaware. Just like he did with the Philistines, he still does today. As long as the Philistines made them believe that no single warrior in Israel could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath, they successfully paralyzed the army. If the Philistine army had attacked Israel within those 40 days when Goliath taunted them, I believe they would have overthrown Saul and the host of Israel quite easily. David heard the Philistine giant mocking the army, nation, and God of Israel, and it struck his heart. The Bible tells us his response in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? While everyone else was seeing the size of the giant before them and imagining how he'd crush them if anyone ventured near him, David was seeing an uncircumcised man defying God's army and disgracing his nation. If you had been there, you would have cautioned David or even laughed at him for deciding he'd fight Goliath. If you were friends or family with him, you'd probably discourage him or start mourning for him. He was a teenager at the time, going out to fight a giant who had been a soldier for years. But David wasn't going alone. You see, David knew something and was going in the strength of that confidence. That was his secret. And that is the secret of the Christian that gives them the edge in the face of the unfavorable circumstances in life. Remember that the king even volunteered to have David wear his own armor. It must have been an honor for anyone in the kingdom to put on the king's own armor. However, the Bible tells us that David removed the armor because he couldn't use it. He stumbled when he tried. There is a lesson to learn here. When we try to use the methods of the flesh to confront the opposition of the enemy, we will always lose. However, when we use the weapon of faith, we will win. The Bible tells us that we do not use physical weapons because our true adversary is not the one in front of us. We are in a spiritual battle and therefore must use a spiritual weapon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 through 5 says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Goliath was more than a physical threat. He was a spiritual symbol, a wall standing between Israel and their victory. The trick, however, was that this wall was not insurmountable the people had simply been brainwashed to believe it was. However, when one man had the courage to walk with the Almighty, one step took him over the wall, and then others followed and saw it was never a real obstacle in the first place. You see, when David was going out against Goliath, God was going out against Goliath. David knew this, but the entire Israelite army didn't. This was what set him apart from the rest. When he confronted the giant, he was not doing so like he trusted in his own strength or skill. 
but simply in the confidence that the God of Israel was going to use his hands to bring down this giant mocking the name of the Almighty in Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 47. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David's reply to Goliath was like a prayer and a war chant put together. This was indeed a war cry in the realm of the spirit. Why? Because heaven rose up. The Lord of hosts was being exalted in the face of unfavorable odds, and he was going to defend his integrity and the trust that this young soul was placing in him. That's how much God exalts his honor. The Bible says that when God gives his word, it can be trusted. If he says something, it is because he intends to do it. He will stand for his integrity any day and with whoever believes in him. This is why the Bible says that nothing shall be impossible for the person who believes. You see, this works in two ways. No negative thing will be impossible for you to overcome if you believe it. And no positive thing will be impossible for you to achieve if you also believe it. It is about faith. David exercised a great amount of faith that day. He took a stone in his sling and fired at the enemy. That was all God needed to take down the giant and give Israel the victory that day. Rick Warren once said, Fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God intends for you to be. You must move against it with the weapons of faith and love. My friend, there is no weapon in the enemy's arsenal as powerful and effective as the weapon of fear. It is the enemy's trademark. What makes fear so potent is not that it is powerful in itself. No, rather, the strength of fear is in its ability to use you against yourself. Its strength lies in its ability to turn you into your own prisoner. Once you hold yourself back, no one can make you go forward. But just like David, you have the advantage on your side. Elisha told his servant, those with us are greater than those with them and the servants saw chariots of fire around them. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one with you is greater. I know that you know so much about the situation at hand. I know that you are aware of how effective the situation can be. However, I want you to remember that you can give that information as a tool to the enemy against you, and he will keep you in fear. God says you should not fear. Throughout scripture, when he was going to move on the behalf of his people, he would say, fear not. In other words, he was telling them, do not use the knowledge you have or the things you have seen to empower the enemy. Rather, focus on me. And when you focus on him, you will realize that the size of the mountain you have always worried about is nothing compared to the size of the one you serve. The greater one lives inside you, dear saint. It's time to focus on him and terminate the reign of fear over your life. The problem is not bigger than God. Do like David did. Commit it into God's hands in prayer and then make your war cry over it. What was David's war cry? He declared that God was going to give him the victory. He declared his victory even before the battle began. He had a testimony. He was fulfilling Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Fear no more, my friend. Make your war cry. 
Declare that you will see the end of that disease. Declare that you will see the end of that financial crisis. Declare that you will beat that pain until it disappears and you will come to share that God did it. With each word you speak declaring God's praise, you give God something to defend in your life. Therefore, fear no more. When God is for you, you will not lose. This is the Christian secret to victory, faith over fear. You have the advantage. Stand your ground on the rock that never fails. He is far greater than the problem before you. Are you tired of feeling like you are constantly swimming against the tide? Have you been trying to control every aspect of your life, only to end up exhausted and struggling to keep your head above water? It's time to let go and allow God to lead the way. Picture this, you're on a journey and you have a map in your hand. You know exactly where you're headed and how you're going to get there. But then suddenly, you find yourself on a crooked path and all your well-laid plans come crashing down. Sound familiar? In Psalms 143, verse 10, the Bible teaches us to pray for God to lead us. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. He wants us to understand that sometimes we'll experience level ground, and sometimes we'll experience the twists and turns of life. But when we allow God's spirit to lead us, everything changes. You'll experience freedom like never before, and the world won't seem so overwhelming. You'll begin to see what you like, what you're good at, and what's good for your relationship with God. And the best part, the leading of the Holy Spirit is one of many benefits of being a child of God. As Romans 8, 14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So, are you ready to give yourself fully over to God? To let go of control and allow Him to lead the way? To experience a life filled with freedom, peace, and purpose? Remember, God's Lordship over your life expresses itself in your submission to His decisions and the affairs of your life. So what are you waiting for? Allow God to lead and watch the victories roll in. And as a child of God, you have the privilege of submitting to the decisions of your heavenly Father. Because let's be real, His knowledge, His wisdom, and the understanding are beyond measure. He's not limited by time, space, or anything else. Proverbs 2, 6 through 9 say, For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. He knows all things, even before they happen. When you let God lead your life, you can rest assured that everything will be okay. No matter what life throws at you, God will never leave you. You have a personal connection with Him. You talk to Him daily and you feel His presence. And even when you don't feel His presence, just pray and focus on God and you will feel His love all over again. Remember when God sent Moses to lead His people out of slavery? Even when Pharaoh agreed to release the Israelites, God hardened his heart because God allowed Pharaoh to be ruled by his own stubborn nature. He let Pharaoh do what he wanted to do, be in control. But let me tell you, the desire to forge your own path is a trap. Don't fall for it. Trust in God's leading and you will experience true joy and fulfillment like never before. You see, just like Moses, God will lead you out of the bondage of the world and into a life of freedom but hold on, it won't be a smooth ride. Just like Pharaoh, there will be obstacles and challenges, but that's where the magic happens. 
God will allow you to face those challenges, but it's all for the greater good. It's a chance for you to grow, learn, and become the person God created you to be. And when you let God lead your life, you'll experience freedom like never before. No more feeling lost, no more feeling controlled. Instead, you'll be filled with love, selflessness, and a desire to serve others. You'll be living a life that's not about you, but about God, about others, and the love you have for all of creation. There will be people who won't understand and who will judge you harshly, but trust me, it will be worth every challenge and every hardship because God will lead you to all that is good in the world and to an eternity with Him. You will face the temptation to rely solely on your own knowledge and abilities. But here's the thing, as a child of God, you have a higher calling. The Bible tells us in Psalms 139, one through four, you searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely from the beginning. That's right, folks. Our Lord and Savior knows us inside and out. And he created us to depend on him. We listen to the lies of the devil that tell us we can handle it all by ourselves. You shall not surely die, but be like God, knowing good and evil. Those words may sound appealing, but they only lead to bondage and away from the freedom that God intended for us. But let me ask you this. If your child refused to listen or learn from you, wouldn't you feel hurt? And as a school teacher, if a student constantly replied, I know what the answer is. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how I know I know I know. How much would this student truly learn? How far would they go in life compared to other students who are eager to learn and absorb new information? That's why it's crucial to understand that God is not against knowledge, especially the kind that improves the world. But he's very much concerned about our dependence on our own abilities, so much so that we push him to the sidelines. So, my friends, let's not fall into the trap of thinking we have all the answers. Let's humbly depend on the one who created us and loves us unconditionally. Together, let's walk in the light of his wisdom and guidance. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Embrace your identity and let your light shine bright, my friends. May the peace and love of our Lord be with you always. Trust in his knowledge and understanding. Seek his guidance and wisdom in our lives. And remember, as children of God, we are never alone. He is always with us, always guiding us, and always loving us. Have you ever met a child who refuses to listen to his parents, teachers, or anyone who tries to guide him? He just nods his head and walks away, completely ignoring what they're trying to tell him. Well, believe it or not, this child is a reflection of many of us as children of God. We say we love God and we want to please him, but when it comes down to it, we want to have our way every chance we have. We don't know what it means to have God lead us. And when things don't go as expected, we blame God for not stepping in to help us. But have you read the Bible lately? It's very clear that a way may seem right, but it can still be a deadly trap meant to destroy you. Proverbs 14.12 There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Think about it. How many times have you tried to do something or say something that at first seemed safe and profitable, only for things to fall apart once you took action? That's when God comes in and says, let me lead you. He wants us to give up control and trust that he knows best. It can be difficult to do, but the changes you'll see in your life will be worth it. 
Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. God wants to guide us and lead us on the path to success, but we have to be willing to let go of our fears and our worries and trust that He knows what's best for us. So, my dear friends, let's not be like that child who refuses to listen and learn. Let's be like the wise man who seeks knowledge and wisdom, who trusts in the Lord and acknowledges Him in all His ways. Remember, knowledge is transitory, but God is eternal and up to date. He will never steer us wrong. So let go and let God lead you. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You see, when we acknowledge that God is in control, we can rest in Him and not worry about the trials and difficulties that come our way. When we spend quality time with God in prayer, He endures us with His power, with boldness, and with the ability to speak His word with confidence. And when we do that, He stretches out His hand, confirming His word with signs and wonders. But it all starts with letting go and letting God. That's the key to glorious living. And even more importantly, it's the key to an eternity with God. By letting God into your daily routine, you'll find that He will help you solve your problems in ways you never thought possible. Now I know what you're thinking. You've got plans and dreams and you want to make them a reality. But here's the thing, we can't just put a plan together and expect God to bless it if we didn't seek His will in the first place. God doesn't want to be the last resort, but the one you turn to on every step. Before you start building, seek Him and His plan. Don't try to pull off your own ideas and expect God to follow you. Instead, seek God in His plan and you'll find that your life will take on a whole new meaning. And here's the best part. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus understands. He understands all your pain, all your hurt, all your loss, all your temptations, and all your struggles. And because God created you and Christ has made you acceptable, don't worry about what others say about you. God is with you and He is for you. He will never leave you. So, my friends, when life gets tough, remember that God is the solution to all of your problems. He is an awesome God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that, my friends, is the truth. So let's stand tall, shoulders back, and face the world with confidence, knowing that we serve an awesome God who is always with us, leading us, and guiding us every step of the way. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. And that, my friends, is a truth that will change your life forever. As a Christian, you must also believe that whatever God's plans are for you, that they're the best, that they're far better than anything you may think you prefer. This applies to everything, including your relationship with people in your life. Hence, when people leave your life, you must learn to let them go and move on, trusting that God has something better for you instead. Don't spend another day crying over a relationship that never worked. Remember who you are and to whom you belong, God. If God has made you special as He said you are, then you must realize that certain things happen in your life by His doing. And even when they happen without His doing, He still has control over how it'll end for you. This means He can turn it around again and again until you win. Why or how is this possible? The answer is simple. You belong to and are loved by Him, and you continue to stand in His will for your life. Romans 8.28 and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You see, there is only one set of people whose future you can guarantee to be good. 
either in this life or in eternity. These are those who love God and are living according to His commands. I love how the psalmist in Psalms 3737 places it. Consider the blameless, observe the upright, a future awaits those who seek peace. If you are a child of God, then you must listen to this. There's nothing for you to fear or cry about in your future simply because someone left you. That your father or mother left you doesn't mean that your world has come to an end. That you thought he or she was the one God wanted you to marry, but they left, doesn't mean that you're never going to have a happy marriage life. Okay, but what about those times that those who left were actually right to leave because you didn't know better and you hurt your relationship with them? Well, I also have a word for you. The Bible tells us that there's such a thing called restoration of lost years. Through the working of the Holy Spirit, you can change and become better. And when you grow in this change, you can't be stranded. God will still bring the right people into your life. They may not be the same people who left, but be sure of this. They will serve God's purpose in your life in such a way that would surpass your expectations. Job was such a person. He never hurt anyone. He served God and loved Him. He didn't have all the verses of Scripture like we do today, but his heart was right toward God. He only wanted one thing, to please God and remain a faithful worshiper. Job 1.1 In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. However, a time came in Job's life when the devil struck him, as well as everything he had. He lost his possessions and all his children mysteriously died in one day. As if this was not enough, the devil afflicted his body with sores. They were so bad that he had to sit on ashes to be comfortable. No cushion or mattress was comfortable enough. Yet Job remained consistent in his love and service to God. He refused to sin or curse God even when his wife suggested it. No one came to Job's aid during this time except for three of his friends. Relatives, both distant and close, stayed away from him. Friends, business acquaintances, neighbors, you name it, and none was mentioned. It seemed as if the moment Job fell into his dark times, everyone walked out the door. But Job never walked out on God. He kept believing and walking in the truth he knew about God's faithfulness. He would say words like, I know my Redeemer lives, and all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change comes. He was so convinced of God's faithfulness that it kept him from giving up on God. And then the Bible tells us that one day God turned his situation around and gave Job a better end. And guess what? Everyone who left returned. Job 42, 11. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him at his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. But where did they go all this while? Why did they leave? Well, I can't say. However, the focus should be on Job. What did Job know that made him not go after them, begging them to be a part of his life or suffering? What did he know that made him not mad at them when they came back? I will tell you. The psalmist wrote, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Psalms 27.10 Job knew the God who takes care of those whom others walk away from. He knew the God who steps in when others step out and he chose to cling to him. Did you also notice that God did not leave Job without help? Though his friends said things they weren't supposed to say, God made sure that they were there to keep Job company as long as he needed. I'm saying this to you if you've been made to believe that you're never going to have someone better in your life and you have to settle for less than what you believe God made you to have. I'm telling you these things if you're the one who struggles to come to terms with the reality of God's future for you, because you made a mistake and someone who seemed perfect walked away. Sometimes when people walk away, it doesn't mean they're bad. Sometimes their time with you is over and they have to leave. 
Sometimes God takes them out because they can't handle what God's about to do in your life. Their presence with you may ruin it. Sometimes God would even take people away from your life because they may not mean well and might eventually become tools in the enemy's hands to hurt you. If you wrong other people, make sure to make it right by seeking forgiveness and declaring your repentance before God and before them. However, the whole point of my message to you today is this. Don't beat yourself up over anyone who walks away. It won't change anything about the fact that they're gone. Rather, you focus on the next thing God's about to do in your life and move towards it. I remember listening to a friend of mine weeping over a relationship that went wrong. She'd been hurt and cheated on, and she ended the relationship. However, he knew she loved him, and he made her feel like she was losing him and not the other way around, and this made her feel lost. She was contemplating between dealing with it and moving on with her life or going back to an unfaithful partner. I had to sit her down and remind her of the difference between her unstable emotion and the clear truth of God's Word, which is our reality as children of God. I reminded her of everything God's Word says about her and the kind of future God has promised her. Then I asked her, Do you see yourself with this kind of person in that future? And she said no. In God's original plan for you, it's a culmination of your testimony of those who stayed and those who left. God intends to use both to establish you and His plans for you. Like my friend, I understand that you're not going to have it easy. It's going to be difficult to heal. I've had my own fair share of hurts from dealing with people close and distant. However, God is not done with you or me just yet. If people want to leave your life for one reason or the other, don't beg them to stay. If you talk someone into staying one more day with you, you're going to live the rest of your life begging them to remain with you. You're going to subject yourself to a life of sorrow and pain where everything you do is to make someone happy and stay. Before you know, you'll lose your value and self-worth. How many people are bearing up under abuse, internal sorrows, and false facades today because they're afraid to walk away from someone they're not supposed to be with? How many are still there because they're afraid to be alone, afraid of what people will say, and afraid someone better might not come? Beloved, your Heavenly Father knows what you need and when you need them, and He has something better for you. You don't have to worry about how it'll happen, but you just have to believe that He's got your back. Remember that God is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Keep Him close to you and keep your eyes on His plans to give you something better. Don't hate anyone for walking away or leaving you. Don't hate or be mad because they weren't there. You need to learn to live your life on your trust in God, depending on His ability to take care of you, even when it doesn't look like it. Please, realize that sometimes, because God has seen the damage some relationships would do to your destiny in the long run, He can quietly move them out of your life. It isn't because you've done something wrong, but rather because He loves and wants to save you. It's time to return to your worth in God and to focus on Him more than you have on those who have come into your life. Your best years are not behind you, they're in front of you. Keep your eyes on Him and trust what He says concerning you. Don't quit because there isn't anyone left. Don't lose hope because the one you trusted gave way. Well, you've got God. Hold on to Him and let Him lead you into the better things He has in store for you. I want to assure you that you've got this. Everything is going to be all right if you don't give up on the future God has prepared for you. We've all had things happen to us that we don't understand. Things taken longer than expected and circumstances that don't favor us. Sometimes you have to know that God also uses hard times to help you grow. So rather than always praying it away, realize God's hand on your life and embrace it. Not everything seemingly uncomfortable or bad in your life is the work of the devil. Sometimes God's involved. Do you ever wonder if God is interested in helping you win and achieve the good things in life? Because sometimes life's challenges seem impossible to overcome. Financial challenges are ever at your doorstep, 
When you think you're about to have a breakthrough, then something else goes wrong. You have to contend with jealous workmates. It's taking forever to buy that car. You have family issues. That friend walked away. The medical report wasn't good. You don't appear to be winning in anything. While it's easier to see God's hand at work in our lives when things are going well for us and we're moving forward, the opposite happens when things begin to look difficult. We begin to live frustrated, fighting against everything we don't like and asking questions. God, why is this happening? When are you going to turn things around as they used to be? Why would a loving God allow me to face problems in my life? Why can't He instantly give me a perfect life? Unfortunately, most believers fail to see how God uses problems for good in our lives. After all, when we accept Jesus Christ into our lives and got saved, we weren't told that we were signing up for hard times. Most people resent their problems rather than pause to consider what benefit they might contain. Is it possible that there are potentials locked up within you that you won't discover except under severe circumstances? David once wrote in Psalms, God has enlarged me when I was in distress. He didn't say God enlarged him in the good times or when everyone was celebrating him. He said God enlarged him when he faced a giant twice his size. God enlarged him when his father didn't believe in him and when King Saul was after his life. It was in the midst of hard times that David discovered the greatness, courage, and favor he didn't know was within him. You'll never know how much you can do until you're put under pressure. Only in the darkness will you see the brightness of the stars. The devil would deceive you by telling you the hardship is too much and you'll never come out of it. But God has you in the palm of his hands and he sees what you're going through. God has set parameters for the situation. He's too loving to let it consume you. God knows how much pressure you can take. If it was going to destroy you, he would never have allowed it. The enemy meant it to stop you, but God only allowed it so he could promote you. The seemingly silent season, when you're doing the right things and nothing's improving, seeing less skilled people overtake you, and everything around you looks like a really hard time. Those are important seasons because you're being developed. God's building you. Think of how soldiers who defend the nation and the people are made. Do you get the idea now? Without the tough times, you won't be prepared for what's coming your way. When you understand that God uses what you consider hard times to help you grow, you won't be frustrated and upset about life. Instead, you would embrace the season and completely surrender to God to teach you all you need to know to bring out your full potential. Most times, God permits these hard times because He wants to build your character. What you may not know is that God is more interested in developing your character so you can cope with anything life throws at you than in just giving you good stuff. That's right. When you face problems, it might be that God wants to teach you specific values and virtues through your problems, such as patience, perseverance, love, faith, etc. You may think, but why would God use the devil's tools to train his children? Doesn't that contradict his goodness? Look, the thing is, God's not using the devil's tools. It's our minds telling us that those are the devil's tools. For example, God's not the author of sickness or diseases. However, if a believer falls sick, God has no problem healing his own. What he does sometimes is to take that sickness meant to destroy his child and use it to serve a purpose instead of just removing it. Various biblical instances are proof of this. For example, God could have easily saved the three Hebrew boys from being thrown into the fire, which was a place meant to kill them. He allowed them to be thrown in, and he got in with them, showing his mighty power over the flames and establishing his authority before everyone who witnessed the incident. This intervention would not only affect those who saw it, but the Hebrew boys would also grow in their convictions more than they ever have, leading to more maturity and effect to their faith. We have others like David, Daniel, Jesus, and even the apostles as well. This is why James 1, 2-5 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. No person expresses a better personality and fulfillment than one who's passed through a couple of these testing processes. One can go from being a stubborn and self-centered person to a selfless and loving one after certain experiences. It's God's desire to see you refined through certain crises in your life and the work of the Holy Spirit within you into a better version of you that knows and completely trusts God. You need to recognize God's hand and stop being resentful about something that's designed to move you forward. It may be difficult and uncomfortable, but it's intended by God for your ultimate development. God wouldn't have allowed it if it wasn't serving a purpose. As a Christian and a child of God, nothing happens to you without God's permission. When Jesus came to earth, he also faced hard times from his betrayal, torture, and crucifixion. Those were very hard times, but Jesus, our Savior, understood his assignment from the beginning. In his prayer in Luke 22:42, Jesus said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of suffering from me. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. He understood. You can't pray away everything you don't like. He understood that loving and trusting God means embracing the hard times, even when it's inconvenient, which means saying, let God's will be done. He understood God's hand in his life and the price that had to be paid for you and I to be saved. Therefore, he embraced the cross. In the end, God raised him to greater glory and power. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Scripture says God's thoughts are not man's thoughts, neither are God's ways man's ways. God doesn't always take us in a straight line from A to B to C. Sometimes he may take you from A to B, then up to G and back to D, then up to P. It doesn't have to make sense. You just have to trust him. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're going backwards, but you have to trust God even when you don't understand why he's putting you through these roots. Paul said, all things work together for good to those who love God. All things may not be good right now. The setback isn't good. The sickness isn't good. The loss isn't good. But God's promise is this. It's all going to work out for your good in the end. God may occasionally allow the hard times to test your heart and your motives. That's why you simply can't pray away every challenge. God is not merely interested in giving you the things that you want in life, but God's more interested in you having a genuine and growing relationship with Him. For example, do you follow God just for what He can give you? Or do you follow God simply because He's your loving Creator? God speaking in Jeremiah 17, 9-10 The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now, the test is whether you'll remain faithful while you're in hard times. Will you still love God when you're not seeing any good thing working? Will you believe that the hard time is just a season and that God can bring you out of it victoriously? Would you believe He's still God, the one who still loves you, even if things in your life prove otherwise? When we're facing problems in life, it can be difficult to believe that God has a plan for us. We can be tempted to believe that God's more interested in punishing us than in helping us. We can be tempted to believe that God would rather see us struggle than conquer. However, it is important to memorize that God does not purpose in His mind to harm you. God's not sadistic. 
God didn't create you so that He can spend His time ensuring that only bad things happen in your life. God plans to prosper you and to give you hope in a future. However, to get there, you'll need to overcome some big giants and outlast some old oppositions as David did. Many of the challenges you're facing now, the things that don't make any sense, don't have anything to do with your present. It's positioning you for something bigger in your future. If you would embrace the hard times by staying in faith, you'll see God connecting the dots and how it was purposely orchestrated by God for your uplifting. One day, a man whose boat had capsized on a deserted island, who had waited for days to be rescued but got no help, found his little shelter burnt to the ground by fire. It was as if things had worsened. He said, God, I give up. I prayed and asked you for help, but you made things worse. About an hour later, he saw a boat in the distance. He crossed his fingers, waiting for it to keep getting closer. Sure enough, it was a nearby boat sailing across that part of the sea. He couldn't believe it. He ran out there to meet the boat and asked the captain, How did you find me? The captain said, We saw the smoke from the fire you built. A bad predicament was actually the instrument that saved his life. Sometimes what you see is hard times is God working behind the scenes helping to reposition you for a new level. If you'll embrace the hard times God's placed, then one day you'll look back and say, Lord, thank you for closing that door. Now I can see what you were doing, taking me somewhere that I never dreamed. Thank you for moving that person out of my life. I would have never met my amazing spouse. Thank you for not letting that company hire me. I would have never started my own business. Paul the Apostle, after going through unfavorable and life-threatening ordeals, wrote to the Corinthian church with such confidence, not in his ability to survive, but in God's ability to save. 2 Corinthians 1, 9-10 Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us again. On Him we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us. God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what's best for you, whether it seems good to you or not. However, in all of this, He wants you to trust Him enough to keep hanging on to Him. When there's resistance and we're uncomfortable, that's when we grow. And for every trial you face, God is faithful to provide a way for you to escape victoriously. Hallelujah! If you embrace your obstacles with this approach and remain faithful, even in a hard time, like Job in the Bible, God will make you come out of it with double blessings. God gave us the greatest gift when we were born again, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God Himself living in us. When you received eternal life in Christ Jesus, you did not just have your sins erased or receive a new life imparted into your spirit. Yes, those were involved, but God did even more for you. He gave you His Spirit. John the Baptist told his listeners that the baptism of the Holy Spirit would supersede his baptism of water and repentance. It would be a baptism of fire. Matthew 3:11. I baptize you with water for repentance but after me comes the one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's no limit to the possibilities that are available to the person who's received the Holy Spirit. And if you've put your faith in Christ Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross, declaring Him as your Savior and Lord, then He lives in you through the Holy Spirit. He also fills us more and more as we pray for His presence. With this, we receive empowerment to walk spiritually. While He walked on earth, the Lord Jesus gave hints of the spiritual life that we will live when we receive the Spirit. John 7, 38-39 Whoever believes in Me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this He meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in Him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. 
Jesus made it clear to the disciples that the Holy Spirit would not come unless he went back to heaven. And thank God that Jesus is seated in heaven and the Holy Spirit, his very own spirit, is now on earth to fill all who believe and receive him. In the past, before the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he could only rest on people to use them for a period of time. The only set of people that he was upon were the kings, the priests, and the prophets. He could not live in anyone, yet God promised that a time would come when his spirit would live in the hearts of humans. This meant a time would come when the Holy God would dwell in unworthy and unclean men. This means God had a plan to make it possible for normal people to host the supernatural spirit of the living God. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 28. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Glory to God, we are in those days of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He'll make you extraordinary. He always comes with proof. He's that significant. There will be changes and there will be signs. Why? Because He's the Spirit of God. He's God living in you and He does not come to sit around, but to carry out work in your life. Maybe even though you gave your life to Christ, you can't tell if you have the Holy Spirit or if He's working in you or not. Well, here are some signs that the Holy Spirit is working in you. 1. You desire to know God more. One of the first things that indicates the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who just became children of God is a new desire to know God more and more. There's a new desire to read the Bible, to pray, to share the good news with others, and to do what's right. This is not the product of a mere change of mind. No, it isn't. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one activating your desire for Him. You can't fake it. If it's there, it's there. If it isn't there, then it isn't. Do you notice that the first thing that happened to people who encountered Jesus or the apostles was that they wanted to follow them and be part of their fellowship? That's right. It wasn't just excitement over the miracle, but the fact that something was happening in their hearts. The Lord was triggering a longing. This longing usually starts when individuals begin their journey toward salvation, asking questions, seeking answers, and seeking peace. It's activated more when the individual finally crosses that threshold into trusting Christ and the Spirit comes into them. The more you respond to this desire growing in your heart, the more you'll seek the Lord and the more your relationship with Him will grow. Two, life transforms. I believe that the greatest miracle on earth is the miracle of salvation. Yes, there are many miracles we experience in the Lord. However, the greatest of them is not the opening of blind eyes or making the lame walk or even raising the dead. It's the miracle of conversion. I don't think anyone can explain how a person can change from a sinner to a saint in a moment. But that's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17. So from now on, regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Transformation begins from the inside and manifests on the outside. When the Holy Spirit is working in you, certain changes will begin to take place in your life. These changes, the things that please God, will replace those things that used to be second nature to you. This transformation turned Saul the persecutor into Paul the great apostle. It turned Peter the headstrong and inconsistent fisherman to Peter the loving and bold proclaimer of the gospel. It turned political zealots, 
tax collectors, liars, thieves, and prostitutes into men and women whose lives look nothing like they used to be. This is a sign that the Holy Spirit is working in you. You'll begin to notice changes taking place, decisions being made, and lifestyles being re-evaluated. This is not because someone threatens you, but because you begin to sense that you're no longer who you used to be. It begins from the inside and starts manifesting on the outside. 3. The fruit of the Spirit appears. When you receive Jesus into your heart, His Spirit came and settled within your spirit, fusing His own life into you, recreating your spirit. One of the signs of the Holy Spirit working within you is that you'll start manifesting His character. Galatians 5, 22-23 lists these characteristics for us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are also fruit of the transformation because the changes you'll manifest will fall under these categories. They show the character of the Spirit of God and of a recreated human spirit. In fact, the fruit of the Spirit is the most important sign that a person is a child of God. Why? Because they demonstrate that you've truly been touched and turned from your old life. 4. You will experience divine guidance and receive discernment. Another sign of the working of the Holy Spirit in your life is the activation of your spiritual senses. One of the reasons the Bible says a person without Christ is dead is that the Spirit of Christ in you activates the senses of your spirit. In biology, we know that living things have characteristics. Among them are sensitivity, the ability to respond to stimuli. An ungodly man cannot sense God, understand God, or respond to God other than to first be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 6-11, the mind governed by flesh is death but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. When the Spirit of God is working in you, He will guide you and direct you. You will not be satisfied with just anything. There will be a strong desire to know what God's saying and to discover that through prayer and reading the Bible. The Bible tells us, as many are led by the Spirit, they are sons of God. In other words, the Spirit of God leads children of God. Maybe you've not been paying attention to His guidance. This is a reminder that He's always nearby to guide you if you submit to Him. There are so many false leaders in the world today, including inside the church. It'll take the guidance of the Holy Spirit to tell which is from God and which is a lie. A solid sign He's working in you is that you know His voice and can tell whether He's behind an operation or not. 5. You will receive a spiritual empowerment. This is another sign that the Holy Spirit is working in you Please remember that these signs are not exhaustive, meaning that there's still more signs out there. However, these are important ones. Before he ascended, Jesus asked his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they received the power from above. What was this power he was referring to? It was the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, he confirmed that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit is the carrier of God's power. He empowers you for the spiritual life. Although many people live, die, and go to heaven without really knowing or walking in this power, it doesn't mean it isn't there. One such empowerment is the ability to pray in tongues. This is one of the ways a Christian builds himself in faith and intimacy with God during prayer. It's an exercise of faith that builds spiritual stamina and takes you into deeper depths of power with God. It's an ability that enables you to pray for things you don't even know about. Another such empowerment is willingness and boldness to declare Jesus. When the Spirit of God empowers you, He will move you from being timid like Peter was when he denied Jesus to the same Peter when he boldly stood before thousands to preach Jesus. What was the difference between these two situations? In the first, he was just Peter, but in the second, he was Peter with the Spirit of God. One denied and was too afraid to identify with Jesus. The other was bold to do so, even if it means dying for it. When the Spirit empowers you, you will gain insights into the revelation of God. The Word of God will come alive to you. Prayer becomes interesting. You become interested in living a holy life and receive the power to reject sins that had a stronghold over you before. <laughs> I could go on, but I'm sure you get the point. The Holy Spirit is such an amazing blessing, and He is close to you if you are a child of God. All you need to do right now is to believe that He is there and ask Him to carry out His work in your life. And when He does, you will become fruitful and fulfill your destiny in a wonderful adventure of faith. N.T. Wright once said, True worship is open to God, adoring God, waiting for God, trusting God even in the dark. Have you ever had to wait for something to come that seemed like it would never come? Waiting is one of the hardest things to do, especially waiting for God to do what He promised to do. However, without mixing words, I will say this. Waiting on God or waiting for Him is the one thing that separates those who get His best and those who get the crumbs left behind. You may settle for the crumbs, but you would miss the adventure of the main course from which they fell. Our Christian journey is a journey of faith. You can't tell what lies ahead except by holding on to God's word on the subject. The world cannot understand how intelligent people can believe in heaven, hell, an invisible God, holiness, and a life greater than sin and death. Why? because they feel these are abstract ideas, fictions and fragments of the imagination. No wonder the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. However, we know what we believe, not because our natural minds understand or our eyes have seen it physically, but because our hearts bear the witness of the Spirit, and we are convinced that God exists and every word He says is true. This life of faith gives credence to your faith, dear saint. A believer without faith invalidates their belief in the first place. No wonder the Bible says that the just, that is, you and every person who believes and has accepted Christ, walking in Him, shall live by faith. If you turn that the other way around, it would be, the just would die without faith. Faith is taking God at His word and standing by for Him to do what He said He would do. In a world filled with many do-it-yourself mindsets, there are things you cannot do by yourself. If we could, the world would not be plunging into the darkness as it is today. However, when you do not know and cannot explain what is going on in your life, you can trust that you have a Heavenly Father who is working in the background to ensure that you come out triumphant in the circumstances around you. This is why I included the quote by N.T. Wright at the beginning of this video. 
The Bible tells us what our greatest and truest act of worship is. It is not in a song, in a dance, or in what we say, but in our openness and submission to the wisdom and promise of God. It is the submission of our strength, intelligence, and abilities to wait on God's command either to move or to stand still. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Someone may say, but I thought this verse was talking about holiness. Yes, you're right, but it was talking about something more as well. You see, the offering of your body as a living sacrifice is beyond just carrying out good works, but of giving yourself in your entirety by faith, trusting that every sacrifice involved in that decision would be duly rewarded by God. For example, it would entail you to obey certain instructions regarding certain areas of your life when everyone else around you is taking a different path. Thus, the next verse would say, do not be conformed to this world. Why? Because every day the world wants you to conform. You tell yourself things like, gone are the days when people wait around for God to come do what he said he would do. Now we have his power to go and do it ourselves. After all, heaven helps those who helps themselves. Trust me when I tell you, my friend, if you can help yourself, then you do not need heaven's help. Heaven does not help those who can help themselves because they would take the glory of the results for themselves and think they did it. Whatever God does, he likes to leave his signature on that all the glory may be to him. Why does he do this? Because he does not like to share his glory with anybody. Isaiah chapter 42 verse eight says, I am the Lord, this is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Is there something in your life that you've entrusted to God and it seems to be taking forever? Don't worry about how long it's taking. God doesn't want you counting the days or the ticking clock. Rather, he wants you to wait on him. Elizabeth Elliot once said, Waiting on God requires the willingness to bear uncertainty, to carry within oneself the unanswered question, lifting the heart to God about it whenever it intrudes upon one's thoughts. This is faith. It is what you must defend with all your heart against conformity to the world. It is your true act of worship. It will affect how you live, where you go, the decisions you make, the things you say yes or no to, Hence, this is why I said the submission of your all in faith is your true act of worship. Sometimes God can feel near, and other times he may seem far. You must drink so much of his living water when you have the opportunity, so that when he seems far, you can still connect your heart to him and refresh your parched soul. Yes, our souls can get parched when we travel down the dark alleys of life, when you don't know how long you have to keep struggling to pay the bills or school fees, when you don't know the next time a miracle will happen in your life, when you don't know the next time you would get another contract. All of these can represent dark and trying times. And during these times, Satan can attack you with the pressure over the unanswered questions and uncertainty about the future. You don't have to fear not having answers to why it's taking so long or why the better days haven't arrived. No, you don't. God didn't ask you to have an answer to why your baby hasn't come, why you haven't been called for the interview, or why your loved one died. However, there is something he wants you to know, that he lives. Job said in the book of Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. 
I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Look at the confidence of a man who seemingly did not have the Holy Spirit living inside him. At a point in life when he could not tell if he would ever see better days or if he would die with his troubles, he uttered these timeless words, I know my Redeemer lives. Child of God, while growing up, we were taught a song that said, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future. My life is worth a living just because he lives. These words over the years have kept many believers above high water and into their testimonies. You need to wait, my friend. Before you throw in the towel, wait. Before you give up on ever having better days again, wait. Before you quit on that man, woman, or child of yours, wait. God is working in the background. Pray about your needs. Sing about them. Meditate on his promises. Do everything you can, but don't ever accept Satan's lies that God has forsaken you or that he is doing nothing. Listen, for everything happening to you, God is working behind the scenes. That's why the Bible says that he is able to do exceedingly more than you could ever ask or even imagine. No one sees the movie director. However, he directs scripts and determines the outcome of the movie. Your life is like a successful script that God has put together. Sometimes your life will look like it is going nowhere. Sometimes it will feel like you are stranded and God is silent. At that time, some people may sadly even conclude that you are the cause of your predicament. Let them. Some may even say God has abandoned you because you are walking in disobedience. They may try to convince you that it's because of a sin that your life is that way. But if you know that your Redeemer lives, and if you are convinced that your walk with God is an honest one, rooted in faith, you owe no one an explanation. The only thing worth knowing is that your Redeemer lives. God has got you covered. You may not see him, but he is there with you. David said that his confidence as he walked through the valley of the shadow of death was not his strength or the fact that he could see God, but simply because he knew that God was his shepherd. He was convinced that even though he couldn't see him, he was there with him through that valley. Moses told the Israelites before the Red Sea as the Egyptians marched on behind them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You may not hear God approaching. You may not feel him, but trust that he is with you. He made a promise in Psalms. Don't worry about the how, just trust him. Stand on his promise. Don't conform to the ways of the world around you unless you are convinced that God has said, go, don't go. Stand only when he says to stand and step out only when he says to step out. Any action carried out in haste and outside of God's instruction will likely result in regret. Don't come to a point where you wish you had waited on Him. Is it worth waiting on God, the right man or woman? For you will come. It is worth waiting. You will go to school again. You will become the one who will lift your family out of their struggles. You will one day hold your baby in your hands. You don't serve a dead or wicked God. You serve a living God. He is alive and he is your redeemer. Don't fret. Don't jump out of the boat. When the time is right, you will know. At that time, everything will fall into place. Why? Because it is your time. Are you feeling a little down lately? Maybe you've been waiting for something to happen in your life for a long time, and you're starting to feel discouraged. It's understandable. Waiting can be tough, especially when we see others receiving their blessings and victories. 
but don't lose hope. God has a plan for each and every one of us, and sometimes that plan involves waiting. You see, waiting is actually a season in our lives that God talks about repeatedly in the Bible. And while it may seem like nothing is happening during this time, God is actually working behind the scenes. He is using this season to prepare us for the blessings that are coming our way. So even though it may be difficult, we must learn to trust in God and His timing. If we don't learn to trust in God while we're waiting, we'll spend our lives in a constant state of anxiety and worry. But the good news is that we don't have to do this on our own. God is always with us, even in the waiting. Think about it this way. Most parents know that their children don't like waiting for anything. We live in a society that wants everything done quickly, and we're not used to waiting for anything. God is not in a hurry. He knows what's best for us, and He's working everything out for our good. So, if you're feeling discouraged and like you're stuck in a season of waiting, remember this. I trust in the Lord God to save me, and I will wait for Him to answer my prayer. Micah 7.7 7. Keep praying, keep trusting, and keep your faith strong. God has a plan for you, and He will make everything beautiful in His time. As Christians, we often face a dilemma in our daily lives. Society tells us to move faster, get things done quicker, and not waste any time. However, God works on a completely different timetable. He understands the power of waiting and uses it to make us more like His Son. It's not easy to wait, especially when we see others receiving their blessings while we're still waiting in line. We start to question ourselves and even God, wondering what we're doing wrong. But God is saying, you can trust me with this. Unfortunately, our impatience often leads us to take matters into our own hands. We think that trust isn't paying off, so we'll figure it out on our own. This is when many people decide to quit on God and question His love for us. However, the problem with waiting is not with God, but with our human nature and society that says, don't wait, get things as quickly as you can. But we must remember that God has set the right time for everything. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. This means that we must trust God's timing, even if it's not the same as ours. If you find yourself in a waiting period today, know that God is with you. Here are some tips and truths from God's Word that can help you. First, pray and seek God's guidance. Ask Him to reveal His plan for your life and to give you the strength to wait patiently. Trust in God's promises. He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We can trust that He will keep His promises. Focus on the present moment. Don't worry about the future or dwell on the past. God is with us in the present moment, and we must learn to appreciate and cherish it. So, don't give up on God just because He's taking too long. Trust in His timing and His plan for your life. Remember, waiting can be a positive thing that will help you become more like Christ. It's so easy to get caught up in our problems and lose sight of what's truly important. Have you ever found yourself wondering how long you should trust? How long you should keep trusting when nothing seems to be happening? It's okay to feel tired and ready for a breakthrough, but we must remember to keep walking, obeying, and trusting. But how do we wait for a miracle? The answer is simple. Never forget that Jesus is worth the wait. We must keep our focus on God's character and remember that His nature and character never change. We can always depend on Him, and that's something we can trust in. As Hebrews 11.6 tells us, it's impossible to please God without faith. 
we must continue to trust God through everything we're going through. And when we do, we get to see God move in our lives and reward us with more of Himself. It's not about idolizing the destination, but being present with God in the journey. We often want to skip the process and get straight to the blessing, but we have to learn how to enjoy God in every moment. We don't know what the future holds, but we serve a God who does know, and He will guide our paths and show us the next step to take in every moment as we seek Him and lean on Him for guidance and instruction. If you're in a season of waiting, don't give up hope. Maybe you're waiting for school to end, the right person to come into your life, a marriage or a baby, or a new job opportunity. It may feel like things are happening too slowly, but trust that God's timing is perfect. Keep walking, obeying, and trusting, and your breakthrough will come. So let's remember to focus on God's character and keep trusting in Him. He is faithful, and He will reward those who diligently seek Him. Let's face it, waiting is not easy. We live in a world of instant gratification where we want everything now. However, God's timing is different from ours, and that's okay, because He knows what's best for us. Now, I want to remind you of who you're waiting on and what you're waiting for. You're waiting on Jesus, the one who is never late and always on time. And what you're waiting for is worth it because God has a plan and purpose for your life. Remember, just because you're waiting doesn't mean that God is late. In fact, there is no situation in your life that God cannot handle. He will fight for you, protect you, and defend you in all ways. His love for you is unfailing and unchanging, and you can always hold on to that in trying times. But we understand that waiting can be tough, and our natural response is often to feel angry or doubtful. However, we can choose to redirect our emotions and trust in God's timing. We can decide not to exalt our feelings or take matters into our own hands. Instead, we can trust that God has a plan and purpose for our waiting. So, let's choose to have faith and patience in the waiting. Let's not let our emotions become idols or rob us of the joy that comes from trusting in God. He is faithful and He will come through for us in His perfect timing. As Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You know, sometimes it can be so easy to get caught up in our own lives and our own desires that we forget about the most important thing, God. Now, don't get us wrong. We're not saying that it's wrong to ask God for miracles or to pray for our needs to be met. But what we are saying is that sometimes we can become so focused on those things that we forget about the God who is giving them to us. You see, God doesn't want to be just a means to an end. He doesn't want to be used like a genie in a bottle just to grant our wishes and then be cast aside. No, what God wants is for us to truly know Him, to seek Him, and to love Him above all else. And sometimes, the waiting period before we receive our miracles is exactly what we need in order to learn that lesson. Maybe God is trying to teach us to trust Him more fully, to have patience, and to let go of our own understanding and seek His will instead. The truth is, everything we need to guide us in life is found in Scripture. It reminds us to trust in God's wisdom, not our own, and to acknowledge Him in all our ways. When we do that, He promises to make our path straight. So as you go through your day today, we encourage you to focus not just on your own needs and desires, but on God Himself. Seek Him, love Him, 
and trust Him with all your heart. And remember, the greatest miracle of all is having a relationship with the God who loves you more than anything. Today, we want to encourage you in the midst of waiting and challenging times. We all have moments when we feel like we're stuck in a holding pattern, waiting for God to act. But let's take a moment to reflect on how God has already been faithful in our lives. Remembering His past goodness can remind us that just as He has done in the past, He is still doing today. He is actively working in your life, even through the wait and the challenges. So, what can we do while we wait? Well, we can pray for God to work in us. There are two main things we can ask Him for, humility and trust. When we seek to accept and rejoice in God's timing and handling of our lives, it requires humility to acknowledge that we are not in control, and trust to believe that God is always actively working behind the scenes, even if we can't see it or understand it. We are in a wait because He makes all the pieces fall into place in the very ways that He knows are best for us. One Bible verse that speaks to this is Micah 7, 7. I trust in the Lord God to save me, and I will wait for Him to answer my prayer. This kind of faith is what God blesses. We may not always understand why we're waiting or what's happening behind the scenes, but we can trust that God is working everything out for our good. And as children of God, we have discernment. The Holy Spirit within us helps us discern truth distinguish between good and wrong, and even alerts us when there is danger. The Holy Spirit also gives us the right words to encourage someone when they need it. So, as we wait, let's remember God's faithfulness in the past and trust in His goodness for the future. Let's pray for humility and trust and lean on the Holy Spirit for discernment and encouragement. The Bible is full of references to angels. In fact, they're mentioned over 200 times. There are three main types of angels mentioned in the Bible, seraphim, cherubim, and living creatures. Now, seraphim are only mentioned once in the Bible. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3 describes how Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a throne, surrounded by these angelic beings with six wings each. These creatures were constantly singing praises to God, declaring His holiness and glory. On the other hand, cherubim are mentioned several times in the Bible. They guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden and were also depicted as golden figures above the Ark of the Covenant. In Ezekiel chapter 10, we see that God is enthroned above them. The living creatures are the angels that worship God continually. They are described in Revelation 4-6 as being full of eyes and seeing everything and knowing everything that is around them. Day and night, they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now you may be wondering, what does all of this have to do with God sending angels to protect His chosen people? Well, angels are messengers of God and they are sent to do His bidding. In Hebrews 1.14, we're told that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So, if you are a follower of Christ, you are one of God's chosen people. And just like He sent angels to protect and serve those in the Bible, He can and will send angels to protect and serve you. Think about it. The same God who sent His Son to die for you loves you so much that He would send His angels to protect you from harm. That should give you great comfort and assurance. So, the next time you're feeling afraid or uncertain, remember that you are not alone. You have a heavenly host of angels watching over you, ready to do God's bidding and protect you from harm. And just like the seraphim, cherubim, and living creatures in the Bible, these angels constantly sing praises to God for His holiness and glory. So go forth with confidence, 
knowing that you have a God who loves you, a Savior who died for you, and angels who are watching over you. And always remember, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God's ministering spirits cannot be seen with physical eyes, but they are always on assignment. And one thing we should be aware of is that there are different angels. Just as we have light and darkness, good and evil, righteous and unrighteous, there are also foul, unclean, and evil spirits or angels of darkness. But let's focus on the Lord's angels, the ones we can access through prayer and revelation. Psalm 91, seven through 10, describes God's providential care and protection on a deeply personal level. It's a beautiful reminder that when we take refuge in the Lord, He promises that no harm will overtake us, no illness will come near our home. But what does it mean for us on a practical level? God's providential care and protection doesn't mean we'll live pain and difficulty-free lives. In fact, it often seems that we are beset with sorrow, trial, and difficulty. But the key is to remember that God's unseen hand is at work in the world, guiding the events of human history according to His purposes. And when we face trials, we can take comfort in knowing that God is with us and that His angels are on assignment. Think about David, the man after God's own heart. He was constantly surrounded by enemies and chased by his foes. And Elijah was a fugitive waging a one-man war against an idolatrous nation. Even the Apostle Paul was beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, and imprisoned multiple times over. But through it all, they had faith that God was with them and that His angels were watching over them. So what happens when God sends angels to protect His chosen people? They carry out His purposes and provide us with comfort and reassurance in the midst of trial and difficulty. And we can access them through prayer and revelation. Just imagine the power of having God's ministering spirits on our side. Remember, my friends, that angels are always on assignment. They were created for several purposes which they must carry out. And because God created these spirit beings, we have access to them through prayer and revelation. So let's take refuge in the Lord and trust that His unseen hand is at work in our lives, guiding us through every trial and difficulty. And let's have faith that His angels are always on assignment, watching over us and protecting us from harm. As the Apostle Paul wrote, all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. But what does that mean when it comes to God's providential care? It means that God's protection doesn't mean that we won't face harm or even death. Instead, it means that God will make sure that the work He began by saving us will be brought to completion. He will provide protection from the temptations that threaten to derail us and He will work providentially to accomplish His purposes. And get this, not even the devil himself can stand against the servants of the Lord. God commands His unseen, supernatural agents to come to our aid in times of trouble and need. The devil may try to tempt us with the same tricks over and over again, but we have the power of God's protection on our side. Now, I know it's tempting to become puffed up when we read these verses. It's easy to start thinking that we are invincible, but we need to be careful not to fall into the same trap that the devil used when he tempted Jesus. The devil tried to get Jesus to throw himself off the top of the temple, saying God would command his angels to lift him up and prevent him from harm. But Jesus knew better. He didn't fall for the devil's trick and neither should we. We need to remember that God's protection is real, but we are not invincible. We should never put the Lord our God to the test, as Jesus said in His temptation. Instead, we should trust in God's providential care and seek refuge in Him. 
Let us be humbled by the power of God's protection and the love He has for His chosen people. Let us trust in Him and seek His refuge, knowing that His unseen servants are watching over us and protecting us from harm. In the book of Psalms, David marvels at the thought that God is even mindful of us mere mortals. Did you know that there are angels specifically created for the purpose of spiritual warfare? These mighty warriors fight on our behalf, protecting us from the unseen dangers that lurk in the spiritual realm. Just like Elisha and his servant saw in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the Lord opened the servant's eyes and revealed the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around them. But the angels aren't just warriors. They also minister in worship to God, forming a great and almighty choir in heaven. Their voices join together in unity, all singing in one accord to worship the Lord. Can you imagine the beauty of their voices raised in worship to our God? So take heart in the fact that God protects his people. He sends his angels to watch over us, to guide us, and to fight for us. In times of trouble, we can cling to the promise that God is our shelter and stronghold. We can have hope because we know that he is with us always. So go forth with confidence, knowing that you are protected by the almighty God and his heavenly hosts. Walk in humility, knowing that it is only by His grace that we are able to receive such a precious gift. And above all, lift your voices in worship and praise, joining with the angels in heaven as we proclaim the greatness of our God. We can only imagine what it must have been like for Elisha and his servant to be surrounded by men, but then see hundreds and thousands of angels on horses and chariots of fire sent to protect them. It must have been a sight to behold. Saints, we want to assure you that just like Elisha, we too have heavenly reinforcements sent to protect us. These angels are not only fighting God's enemies, they are fighting to defend us, the children of God. In Joshua 5, the Israelites enjoyed the benefit of being God's people because with the help of God's angels, they fought and won many battles. This is an assurance for us that we can also win our battles with the help of these powerful beings. Joshua himself had an encounter with the captain of the Lord of Hosts, who came to him with a drawn sword in his hand. When Joshua asked if he was for them or their enemies, the captain of the Lord's army replied, Neither, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. This encounter reminds us that God's angels are not on anyone's side but they are always on the Lord's side. They are there to carry out God's will and to protect His people. Therefore, we should always have confidence and boldness in the face of our battles because we have these powerful beings on our side. We should always employ their help and ask for their protection because they are more than willing to fight on our behalf. So, no matter what battles you may be facing today, Remember that God's angels are here to protect and defend you. They are always ready and willing to fight for you, just as they did for the Israelites. You can be assured that you are not alone in your battles, and with God's angels on your side, you can overcome any obstacle that comes your way. We encourage you to take these verses from Joshua 5, 13 and 14 with you today and let them remind you of the reality of God's protection through His angels. Remember to always employ their help, to be confident and bold, and to trust in the Lord's promise that He will fight for you. Just like Gabriel in Luke 1.19, who brought good tidings to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, angels can bring good news to us too. They can also bring answers to our prayers just like the angel who visited Daniel in his vision in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel fasted and prayed for three weeks, and at the end of the period, the angel assigned to bring him answers arrived. The angel showed him visions of future events and explained the revelation to him. 
The scripture in Matthew 4, 6 says, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. This means that God has assigned angels to protect us, and as we go about our daily activities, we are safeguarded by these angels. And unfortunately, we may not always recognize their works. However, when something troubling happens or a challenging situation comes our way, we can be assured that our angels are there to fight for us. They are watching from the supernatural realm and have been given charge over us. As we put our faith in God, we can trust that He will send His angels to protect us.